Hello and a very warm welcome. You're watching Gravitas with me, Molly Gampir. A war between Israel and Iran appears inevitable. Israel is weighing its response. Iran is already preparing for the worst. Last night, we told you how Iran's nuclear facilities could be a target. Tonight, we tell you that Iran has temporarily closed its nuclear facilities. Security concern is the reason that's being given. But here's a question. Iran's nuclear facilities are among its biggest assets. Is Iran really capable of defending them? Can Iran defend its nuclear assets from Israeli fire? You see, over the weekend, Israel had its allies defending it. Almost all the drones and missiles that Iran fired were taken down. Not by Israel alone, but with the help of the United States, the United Kingdom and other allied nations, even Jordan shot down some Iranian missiles. But what happens when missiles are being fired at Iran? Who comes to its defense? You see, Iran does not have allies or ironclad brothers who have vowed to defend it. Sure, Iran has proxies, but Iranian proxies depend on Tehran for arms, not the other way around. Also, they don't compare well to Israel's superpower allies. So what happens when Israel fires missiles towards Iran? Earlier this year, just as tensions were rising in West Asia, Iran unveiled two new air defense systems, the Arman anti-ballistic missile system and the Azaraksh low altitude defense systems. Both of these are made in Iran and made by Iran. Let's just talk about the Arman missile system first. Iran claims that this system has a medium range and a high altitude. It can identify targets at 180 kilometers. The target can be engaged and destroyed at 120 kilometers. Now, before I proceed, let me just draw out a map for you. This is West Asia. This is where Iran is. And this is Israel. For any air attack, an Israeli weapon will have to travel around a thousand kilometers before it can enter the Iranian airspace. A thousand kilometers. The weapon will have to cross Iraq and Syria. Also Jordan, if it's fired from anywhere except the extreme north. Now, Iran has its proxies in both Iraq and Syria. Will they engage and shoot down an incoming missile from Israel is the question. Do they have the capacity to do so? We don't have the answer to that question yet. But nothing can be ruled out at this point. War, you see, is a game of surprises and uncertainty. The Arman missile system, Iran says, can track 24 targets. It can engage up to 12 targets simultaneously. Arman means aspiration. The system is equipped with Iran's homegrown Syed-3 missiles. It has been developed in two versions. The first version has a passive radar system and the other an active radar system. How many of these systems does Iran have? We don't know. What we can tell you though is that these are mobile systems. The radars and missile launchers can be integrated into a single vehicle. Now, has Iran sent these systems to its proxies in Syria and Iraq as well? Again, we don't know. Let's just talk about the Azaraksh defense system now. This is a low altitude defense system, like I said. It can provide close-in surface-to-air fire. Iran claims that this system also can be mounted on multiple vehicle types. And Iran believes that the Azaraksh system can safeguard Iran's critical and vital facilities from drone and micro-air vehicle threats. The system uses three-dimensional radar system. There is also an electro-optical search system and cutting-edge thermal seekers. 
Together, they help this system detect and destroy targets at the shortest possible time. And this system is suitable for both day and night operations. Iran also has the Kordat 3 air defense system. It is manufactured by the Aerospace Force of the IRGC. The system is equipped with homegrown missiles. And reports say, in fact, that the, it was the Kordat 3 that Iran had used to shoot down the U.S. Air Force RQ-4A Global Hawk drone in the year 2019. Now, Iran claimed the American spy drone had entered Iranian territory. The U.S. claimed the incident occurred in international airspace over the Strait of Hormuz. This was in the year 2019. Today, Iran also has the Kordat 15 missile system. It has been developed by the Iran Aviation Industries Organization. The system was unveiled in 2019. It is equipped with Mach 3 and long-range missiles. The system is capable of intercepting and destroying up to six incoming targets simultaneously. And what kind of targets are we talking about? Fighter jets, cruise missiles, unmanned combat aerial vehicles. Kordas 15 can also detect stealth targets from a distance of 85 kilometers. Now this is an important point to note here because Israel has stealth fighter jets and Iran claims to have the capacity to detect and destroy these jets. Iran, by the way, also has drones that are designed to intercept incoming targets. The potential of the Iranian drones being on full display at another battleground. Iranian drones have helped Russia inflict damage on Ukraine. Iran has Russia's S-300 anti-aircraft system. It is a surface-to-air missile system. It is fully automated. S-300 S has engaged ballistic missiles, also aircraft. And let me just tell you a little bit about how the system really works. First, the S-300's radar tracks objects over a range of 300 kilometers. The information is then relayed to the command vehicle, which studies the potential target. And based on the analysis, the command vehicle orders the engagement radar to launch missiles. The S-400 can engage up to six targets at once. Iran also has the indigenously produced Syed air defense system. It can intercept aerial threats at a range of over 100 kilometers. Iran's defense ministry claiming it has successfully manufactured a number of surface-to-air missile systems, some of them being Bavar 373, Talash and Mersad. In short, as and when Israel decides to respond, Iran is unlikely to be caught helpless. Tehran does have the means to defend itself, at least on paper. But what happens during the real engagement is hard to say. Because you see, this is uncharted territory. You have Iran and Israel on the brink of a direct war. Never before has the world seen a direct confrontation between the two countries who were friends, remember, a few decades ago, before the revolution in Iran. It is the 16th of April, 2024, and a new red line is being drawn. And it looks like Iran has been preparing for the worst for a while now. It has been holding drills of air defense forces. The latest drill, in fact, was conducted in January this year itself, after its engaged exchange of fire with Pakistan. These drills lasted two days, covered areas stretching from Abadan in southwestern Khuzestan province to Chabahar in southeastern Sistan. Taking part in the exercises were Iran, IRGC, Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, the Army and the Aerospace Force. Iran's state media said that during this drill, the Iranian forces employed a new air defense method utilizing drones. Does that mean that as and when Israeli missiles come raining down on Iran, drones will make up the Iran's first line of defense? Iran's president, Ibrahim Raisi, has said Israel will face painful response if it takes the slightest action. Israel's allies 
do not want it to attack Iran. They are scrambling, in fact, to avoid a larger war. They are urging restraint. The U.S. has made it clear to Israel that it will not be party to any counterattack. We told you that yesterday. And now we are learning that the U.S. is reportedly not even considering slapping more oil sanctions on Iran. Oil, remember, is one of Iran's biggest exports. Iran holds 10% of the world's oil reserves, in fact, 15% of the gas reserves. Iran is the third largest producer within the OPEC, which is the organization of the petroleum exporting countries. The Biden administration, reports say, is hesitant to punish Iran by imposing fresh sanctions on the oil sector. And the reason is twofold. Number one, fresh sanctions on Iranian oil will lead to a further rise in global oil prices. Iran accounts for 3% of the total oil output. In March, Iran's crude oil exports averaged 1.61 million barrels per day. Also keep in mind that in November, Biden faces presidential elections. And the last thing he wants is to anger the voters by contributing to a rising oil and gas price. Reason number two. By further sanctioning Iranian oil, the U.S. stands to antagonize China, which is the biggest buyer of Iranian oil. Now, I don't know how many of you know this, but many of China's small and mid-sized independent refineries also buy Iranian oil in Yuan. That's the level of oil business between the two sides. So while the U.S. Treasury prepares to tighten sanctions against Iran, Reuters reports that Iranian oil is unlikely to feature in the document. That's the bit about economic sanctions. Let's talk about the military now. On ground as well, there is no appetite left for an Israel-Iran war, let alone a wider regional war. The U.S. and its allies are already drained by the war in Ukraine. The U.S. is also leading a naval force in the Red Sea. It's another story that the force is not making much of a difference or being much of a deterrence at sea. But troops and resources are engaged there nonetheless. And which is why Israel's allies are asking it to not escalate the tensions any further. In fact, British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak is telling Israel to show restraint. British Foreign Secretary David Cameron is asking Israel to quote-unquote be smart as well as tough. The message for Israel from the UK basically is to avoid striking Iran. What about Jordan? Like we were telling you, it shot down Iranian missiles over the weekend. But now Jordan is facing protests at home for defending Israel, which tells you a lot about whether or not Jordan is in a position to get, to get pulled into Israel's war. In fact, French President Emmanuel Macron is saying that he will, quote unquote, convince Israel that we must not respond by escalating. But then, will the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu listen is the question. Israel's allies have clearly set limits, but Netanyahu may not abide by them. And chances are, he will cross the red line. And the reason is simple. Political ambition. And we discussed this at length yesterday. How extending a war or starting a wider war helps Netanyahu in the face of protests and a steadily falling popularity rating. And which is why it's not surprising that the narrative coming out of Israel is one of revenge. The possibilities available to the state of Israel are wider. And yet, we need to do, as the chief of staff said, and we will do everything that is needed in order to defend the state of Israel. And we will do it in a timing of our choosing. Some U.S. officials, in fact, have been telling the media that Netanyahu could possibly throw caution out of the window. Israel could respond quickly without thinking of the potential fallout. Well, Gravitas viewers should not be surprised. So what happens when an Israel-Iran war does break out? Will Israel be able to take on Iran alone without its allies? Whether or not we like the sound of it, Israel is already engaged in a three-front war. The Israeli troops are fighting Hamas in Gaza. Hezbollah is firing missiles into Israel from across Israel's border with Lebanon. Earlier today, Hezbollah claimed it hit the Iron Dome battery in the upper Galilee in northern Israel.
Lebanese media, on the other hand, reported today that an Israeli drone has struck vehicles in southern Lebanon and at least one person has died. The situation in the West Bank is also heating up with clashes between Palestinians and Israeli settlers. Two Palestinians have been shot dead near the West Bank village. You see, the IDF is stretched. Can it really afford to fight another war? Also, this will not be an easy war in terms of logistics or even options. Consider this. As and when Israel decides to hit Iran, what aerial route will it take? Israeli missiles or fighter jets will have to cross Iraq and Syria to get to Iran, or Israeli jets would have to go via Jordan and Saudi Arabia. Will these countries allow Israel to use their airspace for war? Iraq and Syria have Iran-backed militia. As for the other route, it helps regional players to stay out. Sources from within the Saudi Arabia government, for example, are already trying to clarify that the kingdom did not participate in shooting down Iranian missiles. You see, no one wants to drag West Asia into another war, except perhaps Benjamin Netanyahu. When the Israeli prime minister decides to order the IDF to fire, will Israel's allies be forced to play proxies? While the U.S. has said it will not take part in counterattacks, will it really totally wash its hands off? Sounds, sounds impossible, does it not? See, the fact is that American warships remain in the region. On Sunday, the U.S.'s Kearney and the U.S.'s Arleigh Boak shot down missiles at sea. The U.S. has also confirmed the movement of some additional squadron to West Asia, where exactly the squadron is based, that the Pentagon has not said. But my point here is simple. Will American warships and weapons do nothing as Israel exchanges fire with Iran? Will Washington stop gathering and sharing intel with Israel? Will the British warships choose to not engage if Iranian proxies start shooting down Israeli missiles bound for Iran? Or will Israel's allies be forced to play proxies in Netanyahu's war on Iran? And to get us up to date with the latest coming in from on the ground as the situation fast develops is our correspondent Jody Cohen. She's joining us live on the broadcast from Ranana in Israel. Uh, Jody, a lot is being said regarding Israel's plan of action. What are you hearing from on the ground? Hi, Molly. So today I was speaking with Colonel Miri Eisen, the head of the Institute of Counterterrorism, a military expert and former advisor to Prime Minister Netanyahu. Now, she called Iran's attack on Israel unprecedented in modern times. And the general feeling in Israel, and I have to say it's not just from supporters of Netanyahu, but across the most of the political spectrum, the feeling is that Israel could respond independently to Iran's attack. And that although 99% of the 300 120 Iranian missiles and drones were intercepted good defense is not the same as deterrence. Now, Prime Minister Netanyahu has reportedly asked the Israel Defense Forces to provide a target list for a strike which would send a message but not cause casualties. And War Cabinet Minister Benny Gantz has said that Israel will respond in the place, manner and time it chooses. An Israeli media reporter suggested that the war cabinet is formulating a response that would not spark a regional war or break up the coalition that helped to intercept those projectiles. And Eisen expects um, the defensive military cooperation, which we saw over the weekends between Israel, the US, UK, France, uh, Jordan and the Gulf states. She expects that to continue and suggested that Israel's response could come in the form of a cyber attack or an attack on an Iranian proxy in the region or on IRGC forces around the world. Now the war cabinet is expected to meet this evening and it's possibly it's possible that we'll know more after that. All right, we are leaving it there for the moment. Jody, thanks very much for that update. And of course, we're coming back to you as and when we have further updates coming in.
Now, while the conflict in West Asia occupies America's attention, one country feels particularly neglected by its greatest ally. I'm talking about Ukraine here. Battered by two years of relentless Russian assault and dependent on the NATO to defend itself, Ukraine is struggling for more arms and more attention. Growing increasingly frustrated over the delays in Western aid, its president, Volodymyr Zelensky, has urged the West to defend Ukraine in the same way it defended Israel from Iran last Saturday. You see, when Iran launched hundreds of missiles and drones at Israel, Israel's Western allies helped in intercepting them. Meanwhile, Ukraine is facing a severe ammunition shortage. A vital aid package from the U.S. has been blocked for months by political wrangling. The Russians are taking advantage of this. The Ukrainian forces, in fact, are facing new onslaughts from Russian troops in the east. They are facing daily attacks on cities and infrastructure from Russia. And while Zelensky has showered praise on allied action that helped Israel, he also urged Ukraine's allies to provide the country with the same level of support. Modern aviation proves its effectiveness. Modern air defense systems are capable of protecting life. This was demonstrated in the Middle East when aviation and air defense shot down Iranian missiles and drones that were directed at Israel. The whole world sees what real protection is, sees that it is possible. And the whole world saw that Israel was not alone in this defense. The threats in the sky were destroyed also by the Allies. And when Ukraine tells its allies that unity provides the best protection, they already know the effectiveness of this very well. They know and provide. And when Ukraine says that the Allies cannot turn a blind eye to Russian missiles and drones, it means that it is necessary to act and act strongly. The sky is not protected by rhetoric. The production of missiles and drones for terror is not limited by thoughts alone. Now, since the Ukraine war started in 2022, Iran has reportedly supplied thousands of Shahid kamikaze drones to Russia. The Russian military has launched hundreds of these Iranian drones to Ukraine to exhaust its air defenses. In fact, Russia has also used the Iranian drones to hit crucial Ukrainian infrastructure far away from the front lines. And as a result, Ukraine has for months urged its Western allies, especially the U.S., to summon the quote-unquote political will and send Kiev the air defenses and weaponry it needs to protect its skies. In fact, the Ukrainian foreign minister, Dmytro Kuleba, has been very blunt in his demand as well. Speaking on national television on Sunday, Kuleba said that talks were on to secure more American Patriot systems. But while he said that, you could sense a measure of frustration that Ukraine is feeling at this point, you know, given the time it is taking to acquire them. The Ukrainian foreign minister has said, and I'm quoting now, with all my due respect and gratitude to the United States of America, do you believe that the U.S. Army does not have one spare Patriot battery that it can transfer to Ukraine? That's what he asked. For months now, Ukraine has been battered by Russian attacks. Russian air assaults have wreaked havoc in Ukraine, pummeling Ukraine's electrical grid and leaving millions of citizens without electricity. And in contrast, last weekend, as military supplies from Iran, Iraq, Syria, Yemen advanced towards their targets in Israel, the U.S. forces reacted with fighter jets, a Patriot defense system, American destroyers. And America, by the way, was not alone in helping Israel. The U.K., France, even Jordan stepped up to aid Israel in defending itself. America and friends united to help Israel, apparently knocking down 99% of the hundreds of missiles and drones that were launched by Iran on Saturday. Naturally, Ukraine is frustrated and is feeling left out. The difference in the American response is not lost on Ukraine. Yes, America's focus has shifted to tensions in West Asia. Last week alone, Russia reportedly launched 130 Shahed drones. 80 missiles, 700 guided aerial bombs at Ukraine. Ukraine already outgunned 
and outnumbered, managed to fend off some of those, but the immediate international response to Iran's attack on Israel is proof of how West, Western air defense can actually save lives. For Ukraine, it was a vindication of what they had been asking for for so long. And as per the latest assessment by the American think tank, the Institute for the Study of War, Israel's successful defense against Iran's attack shows the vulnerabilities that Ukraine faces in the face of the continued degradation of its air defenses. Ukraine's geographic proximity to Russia is a major challenge. Russian missiles and drones only have to travel short distances to reach their targets, given Ukraine is just minute, giving Ukraine just minutes to react. And in comparison, Israel and its partners had several hours to prepare for the weekend strikes by Iran. As it stands now, a $60 billion aid package has been stalled in the Congress. Ukraine is in urgent need of ammunition. Otherwise, it risks losing that war. The question is, can the collective West afford losing the war to Russia? That's a question it needs to ask itself. And at this point, we're getting some breaking inputs coming in. On Tuesday morning, the U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin spoke with China's Minister of National Defense. And this, by the way, marks the first engagement that the two have had in over a year as the two countries seek to restore military ties. And during their call, the two reportedly discussed a bunch of issues underlining U.S.-China defense ties. They also talked about regional and global security issues. The phone call, remember, comes as U.S. President Joe Biden and the Chinese President Xi Jinping have sought to manage tensions. And after the two leaders last year resumed direct military talks. Let's go straight across now to our correspondent, Susan Tehrani, who has been tracking all those developments, uh, is now joining us live on the broadcast. Uh, Susan, what are you picking up on what transpired during that conversation between Lloyd Austin and his Chinese counterpart? Now, this engagement also coming at a time when a lot has been said about the role that China can play in helping avert an all-out war in West Asia. What was discussed? What can you tell us? Yeah, while the readout didn't specifically mention the Middle East region or Israel's possible retaliatory attacks against Iran, we do know that the United States has been trying to maintain those channels of communication with China, considering the fact that China uh, is a trading partner of Iran, perhaps the biggest and continuously buys Iranian oil, despite sanctions imposed against the Islamic Republic. What we're also picking up is that the Chinese foreign minister, uh, before Lloyd Austin and uh, his ca Chinese counterparts discussion, talked with his Iranian counterpart, Amir Abdullahian, about uh, the next steps. And according to Abdullahian, Iran's uh, operations are over. Uh, and, and uh, you know, they both condemned uh, what's happening in Gaza. But we can really take away that while China is talking to Iran on the one hand, and then these Chinese officials are talking to the United States on the other, perhaps no better country with more influence than China uh, can sort of play as a mediator. We did hear that a Russian president, Vladimir Putin, also talked to uh, his Iranian counterparts as well. But, you know, Russia is very different in a different situation than China is at this point. I will say there is one caveat regarding China just very quickly. Some analysts here in the United States believe that China, by stepping aside and not really getting involved in what's happening on the ground in the Middle East, is decreasing its influence in the region uh, by not taking a more stronger stance regarding what's happening. Now, this may be uh, to the benefit of China and it's a domestic audience, but ultimately the U.S. is evaluating that aspect of it as well. Just some food for thought. Interesting. And uh, Susan, as Israel's allies, including the U.S., of course, seek to dissuade Israel from attacking Iran at this point, what more can you tell us about America's positioning? Uh, also, um, you know, like you mentioned, uh, if China is not able to avert a wider war, then it would speak a lot about its influence. But if the U.S. is not able to actually stop Israel from attacking Iran at this point, it would also speak a lot, a lot about America's influence. 
Yeah, it's interesting that uh, just very quickly, Chinese officials are also reaching out to Israel. China's special envoy to the Middle East met on Monday with Israel's ambassador to China. Uh, they talked about an immediate ceasefire in Gaza on the one hand, so you have to really take that into consideration what the international community is looking at as well besides a, a possible attack by Iran. The Pentagon spokesperson was on television today talking to one of the local networks, and time and again she was asked, should Israel attack Iran, would the United States assist Israel in this attack? And she would not give a solid answer. She would say, I will not engage in hypotheticals. Now, this comes on the heels of, on the one hand, the White House leaking that America will not get involved in a possible attack against Iran by Israel. But on the other hand, we hear Secretary of State Blinken and President Biden publicly as well saying that America's support for Israel is ironclad and the United States will defend Israel in any situation. So, you know, murky policies may lead to murky outcomes and that's the dangerous part dangerous indeed we're leaving it there for the moment susan thanks very much for joining us let's now quickly tell you what else we have lined up for you on the show tonight as tensions simmer in west asia the nato is warning of a secret war brewing under the sea we get you all the details in just a few minutes we also have a detailed report coming up on the U.S. bolstering its military presence in the Indo-Pacific. In a first, the U.S. has deployed a medium-range missile launcher in, launcher in the region. The question is, is the deployment aimed at containing China? We get to the complete story. Also, was the Beijing half marathon fixed in favor of a Chinese runner? A viral video shows three athletes from Kenya and Ethiopia slowing down so that a Chinese runner can win the race. What really is the real story? People as young as 28 and 33 are choosing euthanasia. They are choosing to die young. On Gravitas tonight, we take you inside the psyche of the people who have lost all will to live. Stay with us till the end of the show. Amid the multiple conflicts unfolding around the world, there is a secret war brewing under the sea as well. It has to do with control, control over the critical infrastructure that lies beneath the ocean. The kind that has to do with internet, energy and power. The safety of these undersea infrastructure is in peril. And now the NATO is worried. According to a top NATO commander, the security of nearly one billion people across Europe and North America is under threat. The deputy commander of NATO's Allied Maritime Command, Markov, has warned that Russia and other enemies of NATO are pursuing a hybrid warfare under the sea. In fact, he says Russia is trying to target the extensive vulnerabilities of these underwater infrastructure. He warns that this network of underwater cables and pipes on which Europe's power and communications depend were not built to withstand Russia's hybrid warfare. The NATO commander's warnings coming after two incidents, remember, of suspected sabotage on gas pipelines in the Baltic in the last 18 months. The first suspected sabotage was on Nord Stream 1 and 2. It took place in September 2022. Russia and the West at loggerheads over the Ukraine war have accused each other for the pipeline blast and each has denied involvement. No one has taken responsibility. But Russia, which has described the blast as acts of terrorism, expressed frustration over the inconclusive nature of the probe into the incident. And then in October last year, the Baltic connector pipeline was shut down after a sudden drop in pressure. A telecoms cable was also damaged. In December, Finland said that everything indicated that a Chinese ship had purposely damaged it with its anchor. Despite extensive investigations by multiple countries, both the Nord Stream blast and the Baltic connector incident remain unsolved. 
and experts say that now more than ever the infrastructure under the sea are extremely vulnerable most of them by the way are owned by private companies who did not know that such hybrid warfare would develop so rapidly the multiple conflicts around the world are putting them at risk all at the same time more recently last month four undersea cables were cut in the red sea disrupting 25% internet traffic between asia and europe and we still don't know if the cables were sabotaged or if it was the result of an anchor dragging along the sea floor but you see the back to back incidents highlight the growing risk to critical undersea infrastructure and it's a major concern in the west it was the nord stream attacks that first highlighted this threat at any given time over 100 ships nuclear submarines conventional submarines patrol the waters in the arctic the black sea atlantic baltic and the mediterranean and for the nato it means ensuring the security of nearly 1 billion nato nation civilians and this is exactly what the nato commander stresses on he says that even with a significant presence it's impossible for the nato to guard every piece of undersea infrastructure He says that the primary responsibility lies with the countries to protect their own infrastructure but such is the heightened nature of fears over undersea security that the NATO is in the process of setting up a center a center dedicated to the issue reportedly it will be set up at Marcom's UK based headquarters in Northwood alongside NATO's shipping center the NATO's maritime command plans on using ai software to detect and follow suspicious activity at sea you know suspicious activity like ships switching off their automatic identification system in order to prevent them from being traced while the US is bolstering its military presence in the Indo-Pacific for the first time ever it has deployed a medium range missile launcher in the region what is the system capable capable of and is this america's warning to china how is beijing going to respond our next report getting you the details the US army has deployed a new mid range missile launcher in the Indo-Pacific region It's known as the Typhoon Weapons System. It is a Lockheed Martin design for land-based operations. The Typhoon battery is composed of four launchers, a command center, and associated logistical vehicles. Let's now talk about its capabilities. The missile launcher is capable of firing SM6 and Tomahawk missiles. The SM6 is designed for extended range anti-air warfare. It has an operational range of over 240 kilometers. Meanwhile, the Tomahawk is a subsonic cruise missile. It is capable of hitting targets of up to 2500 kilometers away since the launcher is land based. It enjoys advantages in mobility and has reduced detectability as compared to naval vessels and warplanes. This even makes it harder for enemies to locate and strike. Where has the new American missile system been deployed? In northern Luzon. It is the Philippine archipelago's largest and most populous island. The US Army has not disclosed the exact location of the launcher, but it currently has access to five different sites on the island. This comes ahead of the bilateral US-Philippine ground forces exercise. Considering the range of missiles that the launcher is capable of firing, its deployment in the Luzon Island would cover not only the entire Luzon Strait, but also parts of the Chinese coast and various people's liberation army bases in the disputed South China Sea and its periphery. 
On top of that, the U.S. could effectively defend strategic locations and challenge Chinese military movements across crucial zones like the Taiwan Strait. The launcher also forms a core component of the U.S. Army's new multi-domain task forces. These task forces were created to address the wide range of threats posed by Russia and China. The missile launcher has been assigned to their Strategic Fires Battalion. This battalion further comprises of HIMARS and Dark Ego hypersonic batteries. This shows that the US is boosting its defense capabilities and combat readiness in the tense region. And how is the Dragon taking it? Well, not very well. The Chinese Foreign Ministry has voiced strong opposition. It said that the deployment seeks unilateral military superiority at China's doorstep and undermines regional peace and stability. Spokeswoman Mao Ning has further emphasized that China maintains a defensive stance and has no interest in a military power competition. Chinese Defense Ministry spokesman has also called the missile launcher a serious threat. But what about the Chinese missiles in the region? According to Pentagon reports, the PLA rocket force has a significant number of intermediate and medium-range ballistic missiles in the Indo-Pacific. Beijing has an obvious geographic and numerical advantage over the US in the region. Now, when the US is trying to ramp up its presence, China is clearly feeling threatened. On that note, we're taking a very short break, but do not go anywhere. Gravitas will be right back. From the bustling trading floors of Wall Street to the vibrant exchanges of Asian stock markets, Weon breaks it down for you to make sense of what's happening as we reveal the key factors behind events, strategic battles, and the game-changing business decisions that shape the world. We bring you all of this and more on World Business Watch. India's global voice, the channel that brings you the biggest stories from across the world through India's lens. Now available in more than 190 countries worldwide, because we believe that the world is one. Watch us in Africa, Europe, USA and Canada, South America, Asia Pacific, Middle East and North African regions. Also available on these digital platforms across the world. We are. World is one. The biggest democratic exercise on the planet ever. Decoding the multiple colors of this multi-dimensional, multi-layered spectacle. We are deciphers the images and the hues. Sifts real performance from rhetoric and noise, claims and counterclaims populist pitches and hidden truths. Untangling, unraveling this celebration of democracy.
and welcome back. Thanks very much for staying on with us. The Beijing half marathon has sparked a major controversy. Something very unusual happened at the event. Chinese runner He Jie won in the men's race, but his victory has raised eyebrows around the world. Why is that? Now have a look at this clip. You can see the final four contestants running. They are running together side by side at the same pace. Two of the runners are from Kenya, one from Ethiopia, one is Chinese. Anyone can take the lead and win the half marathon, you would think. In the last stretch of the race, Hijie started falling behind. Almost on cue, the trio of African runners appeared to deliberately slow down. They gestured at Hijie to take the lead, it seems. This is a competitive marathon that we are talking about, remember. International players had flown into Beijing to participate in it. And just like that, the three final contenders seem to have let the Chinese runner take the lead. Why? Just what explains this? Was it a film-worthy display of sportsmanship or was it cheating? What the runners had to say will only leave you more puzzled. One of them was Willy Nangat of Kenya. He is the Chinese national champion in the full marathon distance. He has said that he wasn't there to compete. So he let Hijie win. He also said that Hijie is his friend and he was simply pacing for him. Nangat also said all three African runners, as well as the fourth one who did not finish the race, were hired to pace he to a Chinese half marathon record. Was that really the case? Why did the players have chess numbers then if they were not legitimate participants? Why weren't they labeled as a pacemaker, which is the usual practice? Responding to that, Nangat said that he does not know why that happened. Fellow runners, Kenyan Robert Ketter and Dejin Hailu Bikila have not commented on the incident yet. This has sparked a few road, all of this. Viewers are angry, they want answers as to why this actually happened. The clip of the final few seconds of the half marathon has been circulating online. Netizens have slammed the way the race unfolded. They say the competition was rigged and have called for a probe into the matter. The organizer, Beijing Sports Competition Management and International Exchange Center say that an investigation has been launched. The global governing body, World Athletics, has said that integrity of the sport is their highest priority. You see, it is one thing to cross the line together, hand in hand. Yes, that would have been a show of sportsman spirit, but that is not what appears to have happened. The African runners appear to have let Hijie win. It almost seemed like charity. That is, if they were not paid to do it. Right now, nothing can be clearly ruled out. This not only makes a mockery of the marathon, but also undermines Hijie's previous achievements. The athlete is an Asian Games marathon gold medalist. Did he really need other runners to deliberately slow down just so that he could win? And what kind of victory is that anyway? Now, we don't know if the marathon was rigged or if Nangat's claims of being a pacemaker are credible. What we do know is accusations in China over cheating in sports are not new, especially with distance running. In fact, in the year 2018, a half marathon in Shenzhen was embroiled in a major controversy. 258 of its participants were accused of cheating. Some were caught on traffic cameras taking shortcuts. Others were found to have hired imposters to help complete the race, complete the race. In 2019, on at least two occasions, female runners received lifetime bans by the local organizers. This was after they were caught riding a bike during half and full marathon events. You see, incidents like these defeat the entire purpose of sports. When did it become all about winning and losing? What happened to sportsmanship and harmony? And for our next story, I want to start off by asking you, the viewers, a very important question. 
are you getting enough sleep and do you know how much sleep is right for you because a lot of people out there do not know and as a result a lot of them suffer from physical and mental health issues do you know which countries are the have the most sleep deprived people of the world a new study says japan south korea and saudi arabia and while the mention of japan and south korea in the list is not shocking it's the inclusion of saudi arabia that surprised us today saudi arabia has been identified as the third country worldwide for the shortest sleep duration during a discussion on uh, l on al akbaria tv dr mana al shahrani who is a sleep medicine consultant in riyadh Saudis typically get only 6 to 7 hours of sleep per night. He advised against the practice of staying awake for 24 hours to reset sleep patterns after Ramadan, a common behavior among Saudi among Saudis. He explained that such continuous sleep deprivation has detrimental effects on physical health. The result of sleep deprivation on the body, he says it's the same as consuming alcohol. You heard that right? Dr. Asha Rani stresses on gradually adjusting sleep schedules rather than resorting to drastic measures. Now globally the average sleep duration stands at 7 hours and 12 minutes. The US National Sleep Foundation recommends that adults get 7 to 9 hours of sleep that's the key to a healthy living. Experts say that getting the right amount of sleep improves memory, promotes healthy heart functioning, builds immunity, boosts your productivity and overall just keeps you happy. It gives you the tools you need to deal with the stressors that impact our lives daily. Do you know which country has people getting the most sleep? New Zealand. They enjoy the longest sleep durations. What's their average? 7 hours 40 minutes per day. No wonder then New Zealand ranks 11th in the World Happiness Report 2024. And with that it's a wrap on this edition of Gravitas tonight. This is me Molly Gambhir signing off. Thanks very much for watching. From the bustling trading floors of Wall Street to the vibrant exchanges of Asian stock markets, we on break it down for you to make sense of what's happening as we reveal the key factors behind events, strategic battles, and the game-changing business decisions that shape the world. We bring you all of this and more on World Business Watch. trending in the west and all that setting trends in the east and all of this served up with a side of insightful bant we don't just bring you the latest stories we bring you your talking points for the day and while you do that from the busy streets of new york i will provide you with deeper insights on the developments through the course of the day in the us and i will be here at the vion headquarters getting you all the action from the universe of sport all that you need to know about your favorite teams and players right here the show that keeps you ahead of the global curve a conversation you'd want to be a part of a place where news becomes an engaging exchange we bring you stories that impact your present this is world dna join the conversation Everyone loves a contest. But sport isn't just about victory and defeat. When the goats in sport speak, you hear it first on Wheel.
You have to play good cricket over a period of time. I should push myself right out of the damn tournament. We go beyond the stats. Our stories are quoted the world over. At We Are, sport is part of our DNA. Come, join us on this journey. Weekday, 6.30 p.m. IST, 1 p.m. GMT. We Own, India's global voice. The channel that brings you the biggest stories from across the world through India's lens. Now available in more than 190 countries worldwide. Because we believe that the world is one.